University of Virginia and uh, came back after my undergraduate work to work in family businesses that were related to land that either had been inherited by my father and my grandfather, been here a long time, and we've been able to add to that now. So we've got about three or 4,000 acres of farmland uh, down in Livingston and LaSalle County. And while I've never been on a tractor, I could, I could make a, I, I, I could make a pretty good case for myself of being a farm boy. And that's how I ended up at the Department of Agriculture. It is true that I, I worked in a couple of Illinois campaigns that we won. And in those days, Republicans didn't win very often statewide. One was Senator Percy, one was uh, Richard Ogilvy, and I got a phone call out of the blue from John Ehrlichman, who was a Richard Nixon uh, <clears throat> colleague, asking me if I wanted to be a volunteer advance man for the 68 campaign. And uh, if she, anything that got me out of Streeter, Illinois, sounded like a great idea. So I had to explain to my father that I was going to be taking a week off every month to get Richard Nixon elected, whom I had never met. And uh, the first, actually, the first big stop was right here in Chicago during the days of rage, and the mayor was mad at Abe Rubikoff, and it was a big embarrassment to Chicago. The cops were beating up the protesters, and when Nixon came in on the heels of that, he got a warm reception at City Hall. They did a ticker tape parade, and Nixon left Chicago with a 32-point lead over Hubert Humphrey. And uh, that dissipated down every week to the point where if the campaign had been three days longer, Richard Nixon would have been lost for the third time. He wouldn't have been the president. I was, uh, um, I was uh, offered a job in the White House. I worked in the Domestic Council. <clears throat> and when the 70 campaign came around the next year, um, I was asked to switch allegiances and go to work for Agnew, along with, you may have known these guys, Bill Sapphire and <clears throat> Pat Buchanan and I went over and we were you know, placed on top of these guys that worked for Agnew that had come from Annapolis, and that was only a 20-minute ride. <clears throat> so at, at um, and that there were, I could give you a lot of anecdotes on that, but John said, you know, I ought to stick to the subject. I'm, uh, <clears throat> after Nixon went down in flames and Agnew went down in flames, I touted my agricultural background, and I went to work for Earl Butts, Earl the Pearl Butts at the Department of Agriculture, and I remember long after he left, when I went back to see my farmers in Illinois, there were bumper stickers that said, bring back butts and save our ass. And uh, he, was a, he was a strong secretary that cared a hell of a lot more about the farmers than did it about the consumers. And my job was assistant secretary for marketing and consumer services. So I had to be the go-between, the, uh, the, the woman that was running the consumer side he would refuse to meet with her, and she was all about trying to get more food <clears throat> at cheaper prices so that consumers would be happy, and we had various sort of up and down in, in the pricing of basic commodities like corn and soybeans, and he thought the higher the price, the better it was for the farmer, and that's what he cared about. We also, uh, during that period of time, there was the great Russian wheat sale where Butts decided that farming would be a whole lot better off with a market-oriented system, so we unloaded all these bins of, <coughs> of uh, corn and sold them to the Yeah, corn, mostly corn and wheat. Wheat it was. And I remember going to Moscow, you know, on an airplane, a KC-135, didn't have any windows. They took us right to some hotel. They told us not to say anything any place other than the secret room, or the safe room in the embassy, and um, I can remember it was hot and miserable, and it was, um, it was uh, not air-conditioned. And it, we were told that it was air-conditioned. We had one farm boy that knew how to fix everything, and he heard this clicking noise out in the hall, and he said, I can fix that. And he went out there, and he pulled the screen off, and this maid that looked like a linebacker for the Bears came running down this thing, yelling, yet, 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 and it was a tape-to-tape tape recorder. <coughs> And uh, it embarrassed them to the point where we, when we checked out, they accused us of stealing some of the coat hangers, which are the ones you get back from the cleaners. And we all had to pay $20 to get out of the hotel to go home. That was my experience in Russia. But it was, 
it was um, a good deal all the way around because the markets became much more dependent upon supply and demand than the government trying to set the price. There were some problems. Uh, one of them was Billy Saul Estes, who was putting up empty, gra empty uh, silos of grain in order to borrow money. That was one of the scandals. Then there was a salad oil sca scandal out in California, all of which convinced Congress that they needed to do more regulation in the industry. And that became my responsibility. There was an agency in the Department of Agriculture called the Commodity Exchange Authority, and they had limited power over the exchanges, and the exchanges were much too strong <clears throat> to take any. Once in a while, they'd put out a press release saying, so-and-so is fined $500 for, you know, cheating the broker on the other side of the deal in the pig market. But by and large, Congress was not having any more of that. They said, we need a federal independent regulatory agency to oversee these markets. And of course, the Ag Department and the Ag Committee felt that this was their responsibility because virtually all futures in those days were based on ag products. And I was quite involved in the creation of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, along with a couple of hands from um, the House Committee of Agriculture. Now, as soon as I think it was the Merck of started offering futures contracts based on equity products. The SEC thought that they should have the overall responsibility. And as you know, the SEC thinks the margin should be 50%. 50% margins in the futures business would close the door in one overnight stand. So the industry was very concerned about the SEC, which was a stronger, more powerful agency. And they had a congressman named John Dingle who was a huge enemy of the futures uh, uh, industry and believed that they really needed his oversight. So there were any number of warnings that we should never let a bill get to the floor that uh, pitted the SEC to the young little CFTC. And the hero of all that was a congressman named Kika de la Garza. So if I had to name one of the great heroes in our industry, of course, we'd all have to start with Leo Malamud, who was the one that got rid of the floors not right away, but he introduced or forced the ex exchanges to, to begin to explore electronic trading and look where we are now. But, but, but other than Leo, I would say Delegars that came from a, a, a district right on the Mexican border, and he didn't know much about agriculture, but he was well-liked and he was a feisty guy. And every time Dingle came after Kika, Kika knew how to fight back in Texas fashion and consequently, now I think we've secured a role for the CFTC that makes it more important than the SEC based on the growth of our markets compared to the moribund cash markets in New York. I used to catch a lot of grief from my friends saying, you what, you're in the commodity business? I'm very proud of the fact now that one of our guys, Jeff Sprecher, bought the New York Stock Exchange for cash. So I kind of get back at him. It's a wonderful industry. And uh, I, I'm not sure why I'm here talking to you because I retired two and a half years ago, and two and a half years in this industry is is a lifetime. I can only tell you what it was like when I was there. It was exciting. It was bigger and better every year. The personalities were larger than life. The fights in Washington were classic. We've had some good chairman of the CFTC. And then we've had guys like Gary Gensler did everything he could to try to ruin the business. And here was a guy that was a partner in Goldman Sachs and should have known better. One of the issues that we're talking about right now in Congress is whether or not the, the Dodd-Frank bill went too far in terms of making demands on the industry and the banks, customers, <clears throat> that are far beyond what was necessary to make the markets work. And uh, I'm hopeful that if we can get past the Russia stuff and all the other machinations that are taking place in Washington today, that we can start to look at uh, modernizing uh, the, the regulatory environment for uh, the financial uh, industry. Um, what am I missing? Another hero would be Mary Shapiro. I hired Mary Shapiro um, 
not long after I became the president of the FIA, and that was in the early 80s, she was a young lawyer uh, in the enforcement division at the CFTC. And uh, I said, Mary, you'd, be, you'd do a great job over here, and I'll pay you more than the government, which wasn't a big deal at that time. Mary stayed on until Richard Breeden, the then secretary, the chairman of the SEC, decided that the whole market break in 97 was the fault of the futures markets. And he was trashing futures markets everywhere and getting a lot of publicity. I had worked with some of these guys that were working for Ronald Reagan, and I said, you need somebody over at the SEC that understands how listed derivative markets work and how much they complement the cash market. So Mary went over there as an, as a, an appointee of Ronald Reagan. It was, late in his, it was late in his term, so she never was confirmed, but when George Bush was elected, um, he, he renominated her and she was confirmed and she served a five-year term at the SEC as a, as a commissioner when uh, Clinton was elected. Clinton made her the chairman of the CFTC and she served for three or four years before she went to work for FINRA. I don't forget what it was called then, but it was FINRA now, which was the self-regulatory arm of the securities industry and then ultimately ended up going back as chairman of the SEC with uh, the knowledge of how futures markets differed from cash markets. By this time, Dingle was retired and not around to be the menace to the industry. So we never had the same threats <coughs> once Mary was there. And I think it's almost unique, and I can't think of a historical... Uh, I don't think any other person has ever been nominated four times by four different presidents, two from each party. I mean, maybe Abe Lincoln had somebody like that, but nobody in our lifetime. And Mary was the voice of reason at the SEC during some of those fights. Phil Johnson, a Chicago lawyer, was a chairman of the CFTC at a time when the SEC came after us because we started trading futures markets on financial instruments. And it was really the Merck trading the, the, the S&P 500 that was the, the catalyst to that fight. The, the, the chairman of the SEC in those days was a guy named John Shad, who was a perfectly nice fellow, but Phil Johnson was 10 times smarter. And the Johnson-Shad Accord favored the futures markets, and we were able to move way beyond those arguments as a result of Phil's, Phil's uh, energy and intelligence, and I think Phil's still practicing law in Chicago. So that's really all I can tell you about where we are, where we're going. I got two minutes and 50 seconds. Um, I don't think anybody knows. I, I will say that uh, Leo's, Leo's mission to move the futures markets out of the, out of the pits was probably more a, a hand that was forced by what was going on in Europe. There never used to be any competition in futures markets anywhere else in the world. And people used to say, if you want to manage your risk, you got to come to Chicago. Well, that's not the issue anymore. There is competition. Lots of very fine exchanges are trading lots of exotic products all over the globe. I would say the last 15 years of, of my term at the FIA, I spend more time on airplanes going around the world than you know, some FedEx pilot flying freight from one place, place to another. <clears throat> and uh, um, that I don't miss. I'm, I'm, I've had enough traveling in my, in my lifetime, but my children certainly are enjoying the, the, the frequent traveler miles that I have on most of the airlines in the world, and they're, they're going down pretty fast because now I have grandchildren that are going to college. <clears throat> anyway, John... I've loved being here. I look forward to chatting with all of you uh, downstairs when when uh, John starts to feed us liquor. They're all 21. I can tell just by looking at them. And, and with that, I give it back to you.